everyone. I am pre-recording this talk from Michigan, and I hope that you're having a good day wherever you may be quarantined. Like most of us know, there's a lot of trade-offs in security, and a lot of designing good authentication is figuring out what your options are and how to balance those with protecting your customers. So this talk today is going to discuss how we can design good authentication and protections with 2FA, uh, what trade-offs of the different channels are, and how we see this evolving over time. So my name is Kelly Robinson. I work at Twilio. Uh, Twilio, if you are familiar, is a communications company for adding APIs into your applications for things like voice, video, SMS, chat, and two-factor authentication. Uh, specifically, I work on Twilio's APIs for things like phone verification, email verification, and 2FA. If you're familiar with Authy, uh, Twilio acquired Authy about five years ago, and I am part of the team that has helped uh, build and manage the evolution of that product. I also spend a good amount of my time educating developers about security, especially authentication and identity. And this talk is going to incorporate some of the things that I've learned in the last few years, working with developers and our customers on their authentication challenges. So the whole point of this talk is that the failure of good authentication often results in what we call account takeover, is also known as ATO. And this is a $4 billion problem according to research from last year. So the industry is really incentivized to find a solution to this. And the reason that this is a huge problem is because that still most sites protect themselves with just usernames and passwords. And while we hope as you know developers and possibly security professionals, that no one uses something this simple like 123456 as their password. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that do. Uh, so this is according to a website called haveibenpwned.com. Uh, it's by a security researcher named Troy Hunt. Uh, and so this password has been seen over 22 million times. So this is a site where you can input your password or your email and see where your uh, credentials have been a part of a data breach over the years. And the reason that this is a problem is because so many people are reusing passwords that when you have simple passwords or guessable passwords, uh, it's easy for people to use something called credential stuffing to basically try username and password combinations around the web if they've been seen in a data breach, or potentially just brute force and guess the password if it's something simple. And one way that the industry has supplemented the security failings of passwords is to add another factor on top of that, another layer of security uh, for what we call two-factor authentication. And so factors can be one of three things. It can be something that you know, something that you have, or something that you are. And if you use at least two of these three, we have two-factor authentication. Uh, passwords would be something that you know or a knowledge factor. Uh, the second factors that we're going to be talking about today all fall into this possession category. And this could be something like a physical key or a mobile phone. So let's take a look at some of the common channels for 2FA out there and discuss their trade-offs, starting with SMS-based 2FA. This is by far the most common channel for 2FA, and a big reason for that is because onboarding is so easy. According to a Pew study, uh, over 90% of Americans have a phone capable of receiving text messages, and so that makes it really easy for people to onboard uh, new users onto their website because this is something that they already have access to. However, SMS is not a secure channel. Telephony is not encrypted, and that leaves you open to a lot of man-in-the-middle attacks. Uh, this could be done with something called SS7 or the Signaling System 7. There's a vulnerability in intercarrier telecom switching, and that allows you to impersonate a carrier and route messages that don't belong to you to you. But arguably more common is something known as SIM swapping, and this is where people can use social engineering or bribery uh, to get a telecom agent to send my SIM card to you. And this is something that we've seen a lot of people do uh, to get into people's Bitcoin accounts and other high value accounts, uh, but it is something that is relatively cheap and ongoing and prevalent. So SMS is super convenient, uh, but it's not really that secure, and this is a trade-off that a lot of people consider and are okay with because, as we discussed later, uh, 2FA isn't really worth it if nobody turns it on. 
Another method of two-factor authentication is TOTP. This stands for time-based one-time passwords. And you might be familiar with this from apps like Authy or Google Authenticator. It's a way to generate tokens based on an algorithm. The inputs to the algorithm are a secret key and your system time, and those get put through a one-way function that pops out this truncated token. Uh, so symmetric key cryptography offers increased security compared to SMS, but if somebody gets access to that shared secret, which is usually shared via either a one-time secret uh, token or it can be encoded in a QR code, then that method could be easily compromised. But TOTP offers some distinct advantages. Um, because it's an algorithm that uses two uh, inputs that are available offline, the entire method is available offline. And TOTP is also an open standard. So where you see something that says you can use Google Authenticator, you can use whatever authentication app of your choice uh, to scan that QR code or use that token on your phone. Unfortunately, this does require an app download, and getting people to download an additional app to enable additional security measures can be a challenging barrier. So overall, this is a pretty good option, and we see a lot of security conscious companies adding to TOTP as a 2FA option, but it's not perfect. The next uh, factor that I want to talk about is push authentication, and users love this because it's so low friction. You can approve or deny a login request directly from your phone or your smartwatch. It uses asymmetric key cryptography, which means that you have two keys, one that's only ever stored on your device, so you don't have to worry about leaking a shared secret like you might with TOTP. And this is the only form of 2FA out there that really adds the option to explicitly deny a login or action. But unfortunately, it's so low friction that you could easily approve an authorization request just to get rid of it. So if someone is attempting to DDoS or attack you in the middle of the night, you might un unintentionally approve that request. Uh, it also requires a special app like Authy or something like Duo Authenticator uh, or your own application. And like with TOTP, getting users to download another app is going to be a challenge. Where we see this being really handy is when users already have your app installed. And so you might be familiar with push for something like Google Prompt, and Apple also uses this as a form of uh, two-factor authentication between devices. And they use this for logging in and registering new devices uh, that you might not have already registered so that you can access that uh, by approving a request from your logged in Google account on your smartphone. And that's really convenient because you might already have the Google Google account logged in, and this is an assumption that Google can make. So this seems really great. It's cryptographically secure, but it might be too convenient. So it's definitely not a perfect solution. Uh, WebAuthn or U2F or a universal second factor is the new hotness and this is for a good reason. It offers a really high level of security with asymmetric key cryptography like push authentication, but it's also an open standard like TOTP. The biggest drawbacks right now is that this is a relatively new thing and setup can be a little clunky. Uh, you also need an authenticator that's compatible with the standard and things like YubiKeys aren't cheap and it's definitely not reasonable to expect that every user of your application will have one. So as more devices we already have, like our phones, adopt this standard and become authenticators, we'll see an uptake in this as a factor. Google started allowing Android phones to work as an authenticator for Google websites, but that's not available widely for any U2F enabled website yet. So right now where we see this is more popular is within companies because IT departments can either hand you or mail you a physical token and the account recovery process for that is a little bit more uh, easy because you have that trusted relationship with your employer already. There's a decent amount of research out there about the relative merits and trade-offs of different 2FA methods, and I've included links to some of the studies I'm going to cite here in this section if you want to read more later. So let's take a look at some of the empirical or the studies and the data around how usable these different factors are. This is from a 2018 study that focused on YubiKeys, which is a form of WebAuthn. It showed that the setup success varied a lot depending on the platform. 
83% of people were successful on Google compared to only 32% of the people that signed up on Facebook. And if you've been following WebAuthn and YubiKeys, you know that a lot has changed since 2018, but because the method itself was the same across the platforms, I think the interesting takeaway from this is that it shows how onboarding UX impacts users' success here. In fact, more people lock themselves out of their computer than successfully set up YubiKey for Windows Logon Authorization Tool. So it's a pretty stark difference depending on the usability of the sign-up flow itself. A 2019 study on the usability of different 2FA factors found that U2F and PUSH were the fastest authenticators, and in the state of the auth report from 2019, Duo Security observed that these methods can save a user over 13 minutes of time every year. The System Usability Score, or SUS, is a standard measurement used by researchers to determine how effective the UX of certain systems is. And in this study from BYU, all the methods had a pretty good usability score, but TOTP came out on top with the highest SUS score. This actually surprised me since the same study showed that two-thirds of users had issues with the TOTP timeout, but that didn't seem to affect their rating here. This is, of course, ignoring that users still prefer just a password, uh, but of the t actual second factors, TOTP came out on top here. Something interesting to note, though, is that PUSH and U2F, which were the fastest factors, had some of the lowest SUS scores. So there's somewhat of an inverse relationship here. Uh, faster authentication doesn't necessarily mean higher usability. Some friction in authentication is good, or at least that's what we're used to and kind of expect right now. But there's a lot of trade-offs and levels of security with these options, and I think it's important to note that even with its security flaws, SMS 2FA is still better than no 2FA at all. And this is easy for me to say, and I'm constantly <laughs> questioning whether or not this is just my personal bias working for a company that offers this as a product, but there's more research to back this up. In a Google study from May of 2019, they found that an SMS code sent to a recovery phone number helped block 100% of automated bots, 96% of bulk phishing attacks, and 76% of targeted attacks. And one of the reasons that SMS 2FA is still so popular is that most sites have this form of opt-in 2FA, and SMS is usually the easiest channel to get your users to opt into. Sites like Coinbase, who have a lot of risk associated with ATO, still allow SMS-based 2FA because they recognize that it's better than having no 2FA at all. One reason adoption is low is because a lot of people just believe they're not a target. A participant in the BYU study notes that I just don't think I have anything that people want to take from me, so I think that's why I haven't been very worried about it. But hope is not lost. Awareness and adoption have almost doubled in the last two years, and there's a couple of reasons that uh, this might be. Uh, for one, the price of Bitcoin spiked enormously at the end of 2017, presumably after this research was completed there. But a lot of it has to do with how we're starting to encourage users to turn on 2FA. Websites are getting more savvy about how they're making people turn on 2FA because unless you are Coinbase, you're probably not going to make it mandatory, but you do have other options than just hiding it in profile settings. We know strategies like product incentives work from looking at Google Trends for 2FA searches. So if anyone can guess what that spike in 2018 was, that's about August of 2018. So this was after the price of Bitcoin spiked, it was about eight months later. This was when Fortnite, which is owned by Epic Games, decided to offer in-game incentives for its users to turn on 2FA. And if you're not familiar with Fortnite, it's one of the most popular video games out there, and so when they start offering incentives, people started taking notice. And now, even almost two years later, three of the five top related search queries to just the search term 2FA have to do with Fortnite. 
And they aren't the only ones offering incentives. Companies like MailChimp offer a 10% discount off your bill for three months for accounts that turn on 2FA. So even if you don't have things that you might be able to offer people, like the incentives that Fortnite is offering in-game, there are other discounts and motivations that you might be able to offer your customers in order to get them to turn it on. Like everything, how you decide to approach this measure, this problem will depend entirely on your business, but there are some things that you might want to measure. You'll probably want to understand how much ATO is costing you to begin with and decrease that number. You may care about the total number of compromised accounts, but you also might not. You might just want to look at total uh, losses due to account takeover. You will probably want to pay attention to how much, how many support tickets you're getting as a result of the changes, and that may go up, but what you want to keep balanced is the support cost relative to the losses that you're incurring from ATO. Because support cost going up is okay as long as it's helping decrease other costs. And of course, you want to make sure that your users are happy and understand the reasons that they're opting into additional security or being required to enable additional security on their accounts. There's definitely no one size fits all solution here, but I think a good strategy is to delight your most security conscious users and delight them with strong authentication channels and provide easy to use options for the rest of your user base. Because like the security researcher Cormac Hurley says, when we exaggerate all dangers, we simply train users to ignore us. I hope I've given you some inspiration for how to think about your authentication challenges, I'll be around for questions after this, if you're watching this live with GoToChicago. Otherwise, come find me on Twitter. I'm at Kelly Robinson, and thank you for listening.